Well, good morning, everyone. We want to welcome you to the services here, Grace Church at Franklin. We're located at 4052 Arno Road here in Franklin, Tennessee. We're just a few minutes south of Nashville, Tennessee. If you're in the Nashville, Tennessee area, we'd love to have you come and worship with us. Our Bible classes on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock, worship at 1045, and a Bible study on Tuesday evenings at 6.45. We'd be glad to have you come and worship with us and study the Word of God with us. If you can't come, you can watch us on YouTube, Ustream, and Sermon Audio Video. Tell your friends about that and uh, tell them to tune in and, to, of course, remember to pray for us. Now, we have a young man who lead, leads us in worship in him singing Joshua Waltz, and he and his family have had quite a problem here in the last few months actually being sick and ill. Last week his wife was sick. She was up all night. She called me this morning and said he couldn't get out of bed. So you'll have to put up with me if you'll take your hymnals, even though this may be on the screen, uh, 268, How Firm a Foundation. Let's stand together, okay? 268, how, how firm a foundation ye saints of the Lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word what more can he say than to you he hath said to you for refuge, for Jesus have fled. Fear not, I am with thee, O oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God, I will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand uphill. By my gracious, omnipotent hand When through the deep waters I call thee to go The rivers of woe shall not be overflow For I will be with thee thy troubles to bless And sanctify to thy deepest distress when through the faith fair thy pathway shall lie my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply the flame shall not hurt thee I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine the soul that on Jesus hath lain for repose I will not I will not desert to his foes that so though all hell should endeavor to shake I have never no never no never be seated. Brother Joe Turner is going to come and lead us in the reading of God's Word, lead us in prayer, and then we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. Well, good morning, little flock. It's good to see each and every one of you. We're glad to have you with us today. I want to invite your attention to the book of Hebrews. I wanted to read a few verses from the 10th chapter. This chapter deals with the one sacrifice of the new covenant. He begins the chapter by saying, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make those who come to it perfect. And why is that? 
Look at verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and an offering for sin thou wouldst not, neither hadst thou pleasure in them, which offered uh, by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. The reason he said that is he takes away the first, the old covenant, that he may establish the second, the new covenant. By the which will? What will is that? It's the will of God. Christ came to do the will of God, and it's that will by which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ Jesus once for all. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering often the same sacrifice which can never take away sin. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we pause before thy throne of grace today to give you thanks to adore you for loving us so much that you gave your only begotten Son. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you so loved the people whom the Father gave you, that you came and willingly lay down your life, a propitiation, a sacrifice for us, one sacrifice forever, that we might be accepted with the Most High God, what a blessing. We ask that you would help us to be mindful of the great price that was paid for our redemption as we consider and observe the Lord's Supper today. We pray for the services. We again lift up our pastor, asking that you would sustain him, that your everlasting arms would undergird him, and give him the strength and the wisdom to declare unto us the message you've laid upon his heart. And may each one that you've drawn into this place this day be given hearts that have been prepared to receive that word that you might accomplish your purpose in sending it. Whether it be the salvation of one that is lost or the encouragement of one who is saved, that all might be done to the praise and the glory of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Israel was in Egypt for 430 years. Now, we celebrated our 200th anniversary as a nation in 1976. 200, 1976. So now we've got, you know, we're about 250, somewhere thereabouts, years old. But Israel was in Egypt for 430 years. So for 430 years, they were looking forward to being redeemed or delivered from Egypt. And finally, the Lord did hear them. And he called Moses to lead them out of Egypt. But just before they were delivered, he said... I want you to take a lamb and uh, a lamb for each household. And I want you to slaughter the lamb and it must be a young lamb and it must be a lamb without fault and without blemish. I want you to slaughter the lamb. I want you to take its blood in the bowl, put some blood on the lentils of your door, on the left, on the right, set the basin 
in the center of the door. And I'm coming through Egypt tonight. And when I see the blood, whatever house has blood there shed, according to my commandment, the blood of the Lamb, I will pass over that house. That's where the term Passover came from, the Jewish Passover. Now we read in the New Testament that our Lord Jesus Christ is our Passover. He's our Passover lamb. All of those thousands and thousands of lambs that were slaughtered down through the centuries all pointed to him. Joe, Brother Turner, Elder Turner just read that the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. And that's certainly spelled out in the book of Hebrews and it's spelled out in other places too. Not only can the blood of bulls and goats not take away sin, but one sinner can't die for another sinner and take away sin. That's like a thief or a robber saying, I'll take your place, I'm a robber too, but I, that won't do any good. So we have to have someone who's on good terms with heaven and yet someone who's a man who can take our place. And I'm going to talk to you about that a little later on this morning, but this is what we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. He is our Passover lamb. And we don't take literal blood, but when we believe in him, when we come to him, when we trust him as our Lord, as our Savior, when we bow to him as the only one who can save us, then we have the promise in the word of God that his blood that was shed on Calvary's tree over 2,000 years ago, that that blood was paid for our sins. You see, Israel couldn't, couldn't be delivered from Egypt without the shedding of blood. And they just used the lamb. And we can't be delivered from our sins and from this world without having blood in our minds, on our hearts, on the doorpost of our hearts, so to speak, which is what we have when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So on the first Sunday, of each month, we observe what we call the Lord's Supper. The Lord Jesus sat down with his disciples on the eve of the Passover. You see, none, none of that was by accident. He died at a certain time, and he died in a certain way, and he died for a certain reason. So he was the Passover lamb, and he sat down with his disciples at the Last Supper, and uh, Hopefully they knew, if they didn't know then, they knew later, that all of that, all of those shadows and types and pictures of all those lambs and bulls and goats and bullocks all pointed to him. He kept telling them, I'm going to die, but I'm going to be raised the third day. They did not understand. Because the Jewish people, and they still think today, they think the Messiah was just going to come down and out of heaven and appear somewhere in this world, and he was going to take over the world, and that was going to be it. They didn't see the two comings of the Messiah, the coming first as a substitute, as a servant, and the second coming as the king. Let us pray. Our Father, we call upon you in the name of the Lord Jesus, thanking you for giving your only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We pray that you'll bless us as we try to remember him in his death. Our life is in his death. And that we look forward to his coming again. Bless us, sanctify to us, make it real to us, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray for his sake. Amen. Most of the time on Sundays, we sing a song of appeal to the Lord to ask him to come and help us as we study. And that's what we're going to do now. If the words will be up on the uh, screen for you, and we're going to sing that to ask the Lord to help us. You ready? Father, I stretch my hand to Thee. 
no other help I know if I withdraw myself from thee away I go Ah, whither shall I go I want to ask you to be praying for Joshua, who is our song leader, if the Lord will help he and his family be able to get well and to, and to stay well. They've had quite a, a lot of sickness in the last few months. Now, for those of you visiting with us, we're just delighted to have you. And there are two things that we do on the first Sunday of each month. One is we have the Lord's Supper, and the other is we have dinner after the services. We have all kinds of food over here. Be glad for you to stay with us and eat to your heart's content. And uh, you, you don't have to, there's no time limit. You can stay as long as you want. You can leave when you want. It's just something we've been doing for years and years, and we do it on the first Sunday of the month. So we hope you'll stay in fellowship with us. Now look in your Bibles in Philippians, the New Testament, chapter 2. Philippians, chapter 2, in the New Testament. Verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each person esteem the other better than themselves. Do not look every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in the earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word and let God's people say praise the Lord. And you may be seated. Now I've been bringing you a series of studies that I have titled The Return of the Messiah. And we've covered a lot of ground. uh, But in the last couple of studies, I've posed a subtitle, Who is Jesus? In the previous studies, we've learned about the last days. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 1 that the last days began when Jesus was born. God at sundry times and in many different ways spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us. By his son. Number two, we've learned that the last days are marked by the pouring out of God's Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, all kinds of flesh, not just Israel, but all kinds of flesh. Number three, in the last days, multitudes will call upon the name of the Lord, and those who call upon him in faith will be saved. Acts chapter 2, verse 21, it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and it shall come to pass that whomsoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Number four, in the last days we have learned that many will prosper. 
be a time of great prosperity, but prosperity will bring greediness, and greediness, dishonesty, and dishonesty will bring judgment. James chapter 5. Number five, we've learned that the last days will be increasingly dangerous and difficult times. Second Timothy chapter 3, this know that in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of themselves. They'll have a form of godliness, but they will deny the power of it. They will be always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Number six, in the last days, there will be unprecedented rebellion against God and against His Son. There will be increasing ungodliness. There will be increasing persecution against believers in Jesus. There will be ridicule of the Bible. And especially where there will be a hateful mocking of the second coming of the Messiah of Christ. 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter writes, Knowing this, there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, everything continues as it has from the beginning of the creation. Now in our last study, we began to see who Jesus the Messiah is. You'd be surprised what people do not know about Him. And it is because I think a lot of times our churches have turned into places of entertainment. I am not against singing of hymns and praising the Lord. I'm all for that. But the learning of the believers in the, according to the Scripture should be the central focus. Christ is the focus in the church. So we considered Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, and we found out that he was a child born, but he was given as a son. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. We found out that he was the promised Messiah who came to destroy the devil. 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. We considered the mystery of his being from John's Gospel, chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And then the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We considered that Jesus is the eternal Word of God. The Word that has been here from the beginning. We saw that God has only and always spoken through the second person of the Godhead, the one we call God the Son or the Son of God. We saw that God has never at any time spoken except through God the Son, the second person of the Godhead. We learned that He cannot be approached except through the second person of the Godhead, the one we call the Son of God. We learned in our last study that Jesus is the unexplainable one. Isaiah calls him wonderful. He was born as a child, and yet he's called the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He's the only one who can reveal God. He's the only way to God. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He's the only revelation of God in the flesh. And we saw him walking in the Garden of Eden. We saw him as the walking voice, <laughs> the walking word in the Garden of Eden, the one who walked with Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman. We saw that he is the eternal life of God. John wrote in 1 John he wrote these words, The life was manifested, we've seen it, we bear witness, we show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. In John chapter 17, verse 3, This is life eternal, that they may know thee the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Now we need to know who Jesus is because if we don't know who he is, his person, if we don't know what he has done, his work, we really are going to be very, very weak if we are believers and Christians, and we're certainly not going to be able to withstand all of the opposition that is already beginning 
in the world against him and against those who believe in him. Now today, I'm just going to focus on one thing, but it's complicated enough. And that is here in Philippians chapter 2. And the question is this. Before, before coming into the flesh as a man, what was Jesus? What form did he have? Now, I hope you have your Bibles open, because we're going to use the Bible. As I often say, if you go to math class, you've got to have your mathematics book. If you go to English class, you better have your English book. You go to science class, you need to have your science book. And here, you need to have your Bible. Notice here in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God. Now, Paul is writing, if you go back to the very first verse of Philippians chapter 2, you see that Paul is writing. Paul is the author of Philippians, Paul the Apostle. He's writing this epistle, and he's exhorting the believers at Philippi. They're called the Philippine, Philippine believers, Filipino <laughs> believers, the believers at Philippi. Exhorting the believers at Philippi to be like Jesus, to humble themselves in serving God and serving others. The greatest hindrance for all of us to the will of God being done in our lives is self. Self is the problem. The greatest example of emptying oneself is found in and illustrated by the person of the Son of God, the Messiah, the one we call Jesus. So let's begin and look at these verses now. To me, if I can bring out what I think the Lord has taught me, it's an amazing thing. First of all, it says that he was in the form of God. He was in the form of God. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God. Now, what form was God in? Well, according to John 4, 24, God is spirit. God is spirit. The eternal word of God, the second person of the Godhead, the one we call Jesus. We talk about Father, Son, and Spirit. The Son is the second person of the Godhead. He was from all eternity in the form of God. Now, what did he willingly become? Philippians 2, it says in verse 7, He made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant, and he was made in the likeness of a man. So what did he become? Well, he became a human being with all of its limitations, but even more than that, we said in verse, we read in verse 7, he became a person with no reputation. He became a servant, and he became a man. Those are the three things that characterize him. The English version has it this way. In the English Standard Version, translated, he made himself nothing. He who is everything became nothing and a nobody from nowhere. I want you to think about that. He who had no beginning was born. He who was the Lord of angels was born in obscurity and laid in a manger. Now listen to me. He was not born in a manger. He was laid in a manger. Do you know what a manger is? I bet most of us don't know. A manger is a little square box. And a manger was used to feed animals. We're not told exactly where he was born, but we're told that when he was born, he was laid in a manger. Now, our English word manger comes from a Latin word, which means to eat. A manger is a feeding box for animals found in a stable. They were usually made from clay, 
mixed with straw or from stones, held together with mud. Sometimes they were carved in natural outcroppings of rock. And the animal's head was tied to the manger upon which the animal's food was placed. The Son of God, who made all things, was laid in a manger. I wanted to get, if I'd get with Brother Ken, I'll send some pictures sometimes to him, and we'll put them up on the screen so you can actually see. But all a manger is, is about as long as this, about as wide as this, long as this pulpit is wide, and it's usually a few inches deep. It looks something like those things you put at the end of your downspouts and your gutters to catch water. The Son of God was born into this world and laid in a manger. Now look, at, look in Philippians 2, look at verse 8 again. Verse 8, Philippians 2, verse 8. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself as a man to the will of the Father by the Spirit. Going further in verse 8, he humbled himself and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. In other words, he was the obedient servant, even if it meant his death. Now, I'm going to explain something here that I think has confused multitudes of people, and I think it will help you out. And I don't say that often. <laughs> but I think this will help you out. Multitudes have been confused by these verses, especially verse 6. And I'm reading, of course, from the King James Version. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. What in the world does that mean? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that's the great chapter on the resurrection of Christ. In that 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, in the 45th verse, Jesus is called the last Adam. Okay, so you got the original Adam that God made. By the way, did you know that Adam that God made that was in the Garden of Eden? Did you know that in the genealogy of Luke... He's called the Son of God. Did you know that? There are two genealogies, you know, where you trace so and so is the Son of, so and so is the Son of, so and so is the Son of. So Matthew has a genealogy. And Matthew starts with Adam and works forward to Jesus to show his genealogy. Luke goes backwards and goes back to Adam. And when he gets to Adam, he said, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Who made Adam? Well, God made him. You think Adam had an umbilical cord? You think Adam had a navel? I'll let you stay up at night and worry about that. He didn't have a mother, that's for sure. God made him. Made him and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And Adam became a living soul. So in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45, Jesus is called the last Adam. Let me read it to you. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit, a spirit who makes alive. Now, what did the first Adam want? The first Adam wanted to be like God. He believed that the devil's lie. The devil said to him, you can read it in Genesis chapter three, uh, 3. The devil said to him, he said to, to Eve, can you eat of all the trees of the garden? Of the, oh, we can eat of all the trees, but one, there's one we can't eat of because God said if we ate of that tree, we would die. And the devil said, you won't die. God knows that in the day you eat of that tree, you will be like God. I've hammered on this a lot in the last two or three weeks because it's important. Self-will always leads to problems with God. 
Ralph Barnard used to say this all the time. He said, all people want to holler about free will. They want to get up, they get upset about free will. And he said, well, I'll tell you, brother, you got a will. And he said, God's got a will. And he said, you're in a battle with God's will. Your will's in a battle with God's will. And he said, somebody's going to win. And he said, if you win, you get the prize. And the prize is hell. The Lord Jesus taught his disciples this prayer. Not my will be done, but thine. Is that right? Our problem is our will. And so, what did Adam want? Well, Eve took that fruit and she gave it to her husband. And he did eat. He believed the lie that his eyes would be opened and he would be independent of God and he would make his own decisions about what is evil and what's good. He would decide for himself what he was going to do with his life. There'd be no crying out to the Lord and saying, Lord, whatever you want, whatever your will is, what did you want? There would be none of that. So Adam wanted to be like God. But look, the last Adam, Jesus in the flesh, he did not grasp a godhood, but he submitted himself in all things at all times to the will of the Father by the Spirit. And that's the meaning of that verse. That Jesus, as the perfect servant, as the servant who came into this world to undo what Adam did, to render obedience, joyful obedience, perfect obedience to the Father, which Adam did not do, the first Adam. Now, I'll enlarge that in just a moment. The last Adam, who is Jesus in the flesh, did not grasp for Godhood, but submitted himself in all things and at all times to the will of the Father by the Spirit. He gave up all he possessed, all his position, all of his privileges, and he took the form of an obedient servant and the likeness of fallen men. And the way to understand this unimaginable condescension to coming down, how far Jesus came down, is to realize that Jesus is pictured here as the second or the last Adam. And he came to do all that the first Adam failed to do. The first Adam, who was only a man, wanted to be like God. And in doing so, he plunged his race into darkness. The second Adam, who was indeed God, <laughs> became a man, and as a man did not seek to be like God. But only an obedient servant. A nobody from nowhere who is willing to always do the Father's will, even if doing it meant his own death, and not only just death, but the ignominious death of the cross, a method of death, by the way, that was reserved for the scum of the earth. Crucifixion was for the lowest of the low. If you had a certain level in society in the Roman, when the, before the Romans would crucify you, that you had to go through a certain number of things that lowered you to be low enough to be crucified. And in doing so, when Jesus did that, he redeemed his people from all judgments and curses, making them who are children of hell by nature, making them children of God. A race who will be conformed to his image and what is his image? That's the image of obedient children, full of grace and truth. A race whose purpose is to bring glory and honor to him who now sits upon the throne. And so that's why he says, look at verse 9, Philippians 2, verse 9. God has highly exalted him. That is, God the Father has highly exalted his servant, who was his son, Jesus. And he has given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in the earth, things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. What does that mean? 
Well, I don't have the tongue to tell you what it means, but I'll give you a little idea. He has been exalted as the servant. You want to read about the suffering servant? Read Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53 is about the suffering servant. He has been highly exalted both in heaven and in earth. He became a lowly servant, a man born in obscurity. But he has impacted the human race as no other person, dead or alive, has ever done. You've probably heard this, but there was a fellow named James Allen Francis, and this is what he wrote. He was born, he wrote this of Jesus, he was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant. He grew up in another village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30 years old. Then for three years, he became an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family or owned a home. He didn't go to college. He never lived in a big city. He never traveled over 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things that are usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. When he was only 33 years of, old, of age, the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away, and one of them denied him. And he was turned over to his enemies, and he went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. And while he was dying, his executioners gambled for his garments, the only property that he had on earth. And when he was dead, he was laid on a borrowed team through the pity of a friend. Over 20 centuries have come and gone, and today he is the central figure of the human race. I am well within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, and all the navies that ever sailed, and all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man on this earth as much as that one solitary life. Isn't that amazing? As Jesus said to the Father in the Gospel of John, chapter 17, and in verse 5, I have glorified thee. He said this just before he was betrayed and beaten and crucified. He said, Father, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Let me tell you something, folks, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> right now in heaven, in the heaven of heavens, the very abode of God, the command center of the universe, he is receiving at this very moment glory and honor. I want you to look at verse 7 again. If you have language like this, he made himself of no reputation. That literally means he emptied himself. He emptied himself of anything that would identify him as somebody special, as God's son. He totally emptied himself and he became just a man, a servant, totally submissive to the will and the glory of his father. He made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself. And he who emptied himself of all reputation, has been given the greatest reputation of all. Listen to me now. The reputation of the God-man, the man who now sits upon the throne of God. There is a man in glory. A man who has the soul of every creature in his hand. And everybody in heaven knows him, and everyone who's ever lived on earth will know him. And all the demons and devils know him, and they are destined to bow to him. And all who have died, whether they are in heaven or hell, will bow to him. Listen to this, Romans 14, 9. For this reason Christ died and rose and revived, that he might be the Lord both of the dead and the living. 
Listen again, Romans 14, verse 11. As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Now, who said that? Who said that? That's found in Romans chapter 14, verse 11. Would you like to turn in your Bibles just to one passage of Scripture? I've tried to keep you from turning, but let's go to the book of Isaiah. We're going to come back to Philippians 2. Isaiah chapter 45. You got these major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. So we get to Isaiah chapter 45. The God of Israel said this. Isaiah chapter 45, about verse, uh, the middle of verse 21. There is no God besides me. I'm a just God and a Savior. Think about that now. I'm going to have justice done. At the same time, I'm going to be able to save gift to people. This is Isaiah 45, 21. A just God and a Savior. There's none beside me. Look at verse 22. Look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Verse 23, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, it will not return, that unto me every knee will bow and every tongue will swear. The God of Israel uttered those words, and these New Testament apostles say that this is fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth, the perfect servant of God. The God of Israel has invaded planet Earth in the person of a human being, a human being born of a woman and made under the law. As Paul has written in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5, when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. The God of Israel is the Savior of the world. Talk about a reputation. Listen to these words of John in Revelation chapter 5, seen in heaven. Revelation 5, beginning in verse 11. I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne of God and the beast and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. And they were saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and those that are in the sea and all them together I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him that lives forever and ever. That person that had no reputation, he's got a reputation in heaven. He's been exalted. He's got a reputation now. I wonder, have you heard of him? Do you know him? Have you trusted your soul to him? If not, the Bible says it's because you're blinded. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world, little g, God, G-O-D, the God of this world has blinded the minds of them who do not believe lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. He who took the form of a servant is now served by the angels of God. And he will be served by the redeemed of God throughout eternity. He was the servant king when he was here. He took the form of of a servant. He who was in the form of God took the form of a servant and emptied himself. Taking the form of a servant meant that he was made under the law and he was subject to all of its demands. He was circumcised the eighth day like every other Jewish boy was. The Bible says in Luke chapter 2 verse 51 he was subject to his mother and to her husband Joseph, 
The Bible says he was subject to the common laws of society, earning a living as a carpenter. Matthew chapter 13, Mark chapter 6. He was betrayed for the price of a bond servant. Exodus 21, 32. He suffered a slave-like death being crucified. He lived a servant-like life, utterly dependent upon his heavenly Father. And in him, according to Colossians 1.19 and Colossians 2.9, I'm giving you a lot of passages, but you can look them up later. In him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead, but he emptied himself to save us. He washed the feet of his disciples. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He fed the hungry. And when a discussion arose among his disciples about privilege, one of them's mother said, she was talking to her two boys, and the Lord Jesus said, what are you guys talking about? And they said, well, when you come into your kingdom, the mother said, sounds just like a mother. When you come into your kingdom, grant that my two boys will sit one on the right and one on the left. <laughs> and this is what Jesus said. I'm not going to read all of it. He said to his disciple, whoever wants to be chief among you, let him be your servant. Listen to this now. For the Son of Man did not come to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for, for many. He came to be a servant. He came as a servant king. He came to do what we're supposed to be doing. Serving and glorifying God. What the first Adam failed to do, the last Adam did. He served while he was here, but he will be served in glory. And here's the sad news. All who do not wish to serve him now will not be given the privilege of serving him in heaven. He says here in verse 9, back to Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, it says that his name is now above every name. Now I want you to notice something here, and I'm almost through. I've heard all kinds of teachings and dissertations and so on about this, about these verses right here, given a name that's above every name, highly exalted him, verse 9. And I, and, and I agree with most of what I've heard, and that is that it said, well, you know, this means that he's been lifted up, he's been glorified, he's been exalted. Yes, I know it means that, but I'll tell you the main thing it means. It's very clear. He has exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. He's given him a position of glory above everything. He who emptied himself and became nothing, he's now in charge of everything. But listen to this now. It says that, verse 10, Philippians 2, verse 10, that at the name of Jesus. That's the name of his humility. That's the name of his manhood. That's the name of the one that was crucified on a cross. Remember when Saul of Tarsus was on the road to Damascus to arrest Christians and to put them in prison? And he was blinded by light and he fell down and he couldn't see and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, who are you, Lord? You know what the voice said? I am Jesus whom you persecute. He didn't say, I'm the Lord of glory. He didn't say, I'm your worst nightmare. He didn't say, I'm your judge. He didn't say, I'm the king of the universe. He didn't say, I'm the one that angels worship. He used his name of humility. I'm Jesus. And the Lord has taken that name, Jesus, and he has exalted it to a place where it's above every name that is named now and throughout eternity, that the man Jesus, who existed in the form of God, ain't nobody going to believe this stuff but a Christian or a fool. That's right. You're not going to believe it. It has to be revealed to you. I believe that. 
That person who is in the form of God from all eternity. And by the way, if you didn't get the last two studies, I felt that they were much clearer than this study. We don't charge anything for these messages. When you go out, there are two boxes on that table. Just fill out one of them. And next Sunday, that CD will be waiting for you. Be glad for you to have it. But the one who was in the form of God, who became a man and emptied himself even as a man, that one, <laughs> that person named Jesus, who made himself of no reputation, who was crucified, the man born in Bethlehem, buried in a borrowed tomb, every knee is going to bow, and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is the Lord of all. Have you bowed? Have you confessed? The International Standard Version takes these verses and puts it in a poetic form. Listen to this, and I close. In God's own form existed he and shared with God equality. Deemed nothing needed grasping. Instead poured out in emptiness a servant's form did he possess, a mortal man becoming. In human form he chose to be and lived in all humility, death on a cross obeying. Now lifted up by God to heaven, a name above all others given this matchless name possessing. And so when Jesus' name is called, the knees of everyone will fall, wherever they be residing. Then every tongue will in one accord say that Jesus Christ is Lord, while God the Father prays him. He who was, where was Jesus before he became a man? He was in the form of God. <laughs> and he who was in the form of God, born in Bethlehem, made himself of no reputation, emptied himself completely, just became a servant of God who was willing to be obedient even to death, even the death of the cross. The last Adam, the second Adam, who has undone everything that the first Adam messed up. For those who believe in him. May the Lord give you the grace to call upon the name of the Lord that you might be saved. In that great day, when we all stand before God, those who call, have called, or believe in this perfect service, this Jesus, the Son of God, will be saved. Let's stand together. Now we're going to be dismissed in just a moment and if you have any questions about any of these things, I know they're complicated, in fact they're beyond our understanding logically speaking, but that's what the scriptures teach. I hope the Lord will give you an understanding and give you the grace that you believe on Him and be reconciled unto God through faith in Him. Here's the thing. I know we don't like to talk about death, but we're all going to die. Lynn and I yesterday went over to Murfreesboro, and Shirley's brother Billy, who was 82 years old, something like that, he's, he passed away. And uh, I remember talking to Billy. The last time I talked to him was at a funeral of somebody else. And now he's gone. And I've, I can't tell you how many funerals I've done. <laughs> I've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of funerals. Now, I didn't do that one yesterday. I just attended. I just went there out of respect for you, Shirley, because that was your brother. But I can tell you this. We're all dying people. And you know how I like to teach? I like to teach as a dying man to dying men. That's exactly how I like to teach. Because that's one reality that we must all deal with. And the way to prepare it, prepare for it, is to come to Christ now. Jesus, who is the Christ, who is the Messiah, who is the only one that can be saved. He said, no man, 
the only one who can save us. He said, no man comes to the Father but by me. I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me.